Um, I want to thank all of you all, you, the attendees, for being here tonight. Uh, this is a great size group of, of friends, folks that we know, and folks that we have yet to meet. Um, and I just want to take a moment and thank Nick. This has been one of the highlights of the last couple of months, learning with you about our copy of Sidereus Nuncius. Um, and I, I'm excited to share uh, what we've come up with. So tonight, what we would like to do is address three separate questions. First of which is, what does Galileo tell us in this book? What does he tell us in Sidereus Nuncius? The second question is, how was the book made? How, did, how was it created? How was it uh, printed on the press? What are the uh, illustrative techniques? And finally, what does the Linda Hall library copy tell us about itself, where it lived, who it lived with after it left uh, Galileo's hands? Um, so we'll, we'll do that in about 40 minutes and we'll leave plenty of time uh, for questions at the end. As you think of those questions, type them in the Q&A function, uh, either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending upon your Zoom setup. Um, and without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to kind of talk with you about uh, what Galileo tells us in the book. This is a broad outline of what Galileo looks at. You see there on the right-hand side, there are leaf numbers um, describing where things are located in the book. We'll unpack why we use leaf numbers as opposed to page numbers. It's, it's complicated is <laughs> my, my big statement for that. Um, so in the book, Galileo treats four topics, which Lisa mentioned in brief. Uh, he describes his improvements to the telescope, he discusses his observations of the moon. He discusses his observations of the, what he calls fixed stars and the Milky Way itself. Uh, and the last and the largest part of the book uh, is his observations of Jupiter and its moons, satellites. It is important to note that though we won't talk about it, the dedication is important. In essence, this book was a job proposal saying, I am good at what I am doing, Cosimo de' Medici, I would like a secure income uh, and a position at the University of Pisa funded by your family. Uh, and he was successful in that, spoiler alert. Uh, but that's important to note, I think. So let's join Galileo as he talks about his telescope. Uh, this is about two pages of text in the book. It's very brief, uh, I should note, that Galileo didn't invent the telescope. I've seen that, you, you see a lot of things on the internet. Galileo didn't invent the telescope. He improved it though, and he improved it to such a point to enable the observations that he records in Sidereus Nuncius. Uh, the illustration, the woodcut that we see here is not actually a telescope. It is uh, Galileo doing a diagram to show us how to calculate the distance between the observer, the person on the end of the telescope, and the object being observed far away, figure out how far the distance is between those two things. So after his descriptions uh, to improve the telescope, he turns, metaphorically, if you will, that telescope to the moon. Uh, and these are two of the most famous uh, etchings in early astronomical study and science. Um, he discusses four topics about this big concept, the moon. Talks about the silhouette problem, how to calculate the height of the moon's mountains, talks about earth shine, and he finally talks about what you see here, which is that the moon has a rough surface. Uh, the observation on the left that is an etching uh, is from December 3rd, 1609, and the one in the upper right-hand corner is from December 18th, 1609. If you look at them, and you've looked at the moon, as we have probably all done, you realize that the crater in the bottom uh, two thirds of the moon is huge. You, there's no crater that size in the moon. While the moon illustrations are, are, are fairly accurate, that's an exception. He is proving a point in that. He is saying uh, that there is a rough surface on the moon. And he explains this in the text. This is on uh, the back, the recto of leaf eight. This is a translated quote. We noticed moreover that all these small spots just mentioned always agree in this, that they have a dark part on the side toward the sun, while on the side opposite the sun, they are crowned with brighter borders like shining ridges. And we have an almost entirely similar side on earth around sunrise, 
When the valleys are not yet bathed in light, but the surrounding mountains facing the sun are already seen shining with light. And just as the shadows of the earthly valleys are diminished as the sun climbs higher, so those lunar spots lose their darkness as the luminous part grows. I think w one of my favorite parts of this text uh, is he, he's making connections. The moon is, is there, but the moon is a, is, a, is a spherical body with a rough surface is foreign to a lot of the people that would read this book. So he's making a connection between the thing that he saw in the night sky with his telescope and the thing that you might see, say, in Italy or what would become Italy. Uh, it, and it's true of any mountain, right? Uh, light hits the top of the mountains first and goes down into the valleys later. We have a rough surface here on Earth. It's the same way on the moon. So he's making that connection for folks. Following his observations uh, of the moon, he discusses the fixed stars and the Milky Way. I will confess to you all that this is one of my favorite page openings in the entire collection. So I'm just going to let you dwell with it for a second. You probably first noticed that there are different sizes of stars in the asterism woodcuts. That's what we call them, asterisms. Um, and you're exactly right. There are different sizes, magnitudes of stars. There are actually five magnitudes of stars in both of these woodcuts. Only the largest magnitude of star, the largest stars on this page, were things that could be observed with the naked eye. Everything else on this page was first published and early on observed by Galileo. So this is essentially a new discovery of stars that no one had ever seen. Uh, the other thing that I think is remarkable about this page opening is that it appears like it is a single wood block. That's not the case. These are two separate wood blocks. And if you look in the middle of the two pages, about a third of the way down from the top, you see half of an asterism, half of a star. That tells folks like Nick and I, and like many of you all in this, uh, in this uh, session this evening, uh, that the wood block was intended to be in a larger book, a, a larger piece of paper. Um, if you want to see the entire woodcut, the Library of Congress owns a uncut ordinary paper copy, which is free online, and I would encourage you to go check that out. The woodcuts themselves are illustrating on the left the belt and the sword of Orion, and on the right the Pleiades star cluster. Um, and he's he's showing you these these beautiful star fields and kind of and showing us the nature of things that we've never seen before. Uh, and underneath that Pleiades woodcut is my favorite passage from the book. Uh, again, quoting: "What was observed by us in the third place is the nature or matter of the Milky Way itself, which." with the aid of the spyglass may be observed so well that all the disputes that for so many generations have vexed philosophers are destroyed by visible certainty, and we are liberated from wordy arguments. Uh, I appreciate through the entire text how cheeky Galileo is, especially thumbing his nose here at a couple of millennia of philosophers that discuss the nature of the Milky Way and the moon. And he said, no, 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 we don't need to do that business anymore. What you need to do is get a telescope and prove it according to my instructions and go see the same thing I saw in the night sky. So finally, the last major topic that Galileo discusses in the text uh, is Jupiter, specifically his observations of the planet Jupiter and the satellites, the moons around it. Uh, this comprises the largest part of the text. Approximately 30% of the book is consumed with these Jupiter observations. Um, so it's 22 pages that you see there, and he describes to us a narrative in Latin, as the rest of the book is, but also in a series of 65 woodcuts integrated into the text. Uh, I think the thing that, that stands out to me, and reading the book, which I would encourage you all to do, uh, it's there's a great translation by Albert Van Helden um, that's engaging. It's almost like reading along and looking through a telescope with Galileo. In the beginning of the Jupiter section, he refers to them as stars, stars, wandering stars. He suspects that they are stars. Okay. And then by the end of the text on March 2nd, so I should say the, uh, the uh, Jupiter observations begin on January 7th and conclude on March 2nd. Uh, by the very end, he said, he, he says moons in the text. And I don't know if this is quite the case, but it's it, reading it, it's almost like you're making the realization with Galileo, oh my gosh, these are moons. Jupiter has satellites, Satellite wouldn't have been a word at the time to use, but it has bodies orbiting around it. Uh, and this proposes some interesting questions that 
lead to some, some scientific disagreement as time goes on, but it's no argument one way or the other. Uh, after the Jupiter uh, discussion, he has a very short conclusion, and that's it. That's the book. It's a short read. It is engaging. Like I said, I would exhort you to, to read a translation or the Latin if you, if you have the Latin, and uh, there's a, you could read the Linda Hall Library digital copy online uh, if you were so inclined. Uh, but because this is kind of the end of the what the book does section, I, I want to have two points about some people ask why the book is so famous. Well, the first thing, and I hope I've kind of teased this out some, is that it provides the foundations of modern observational astronomy. He said, these are the things that I saw. This is how I did it. Uh, you should go see them yourself. Uh, but I think a part of that, too, is it is the earliest published account of observations of the moon, uh, of the moons around Jupiter, uh, the fixed stars, and the Milky Way itself. So it, it just it sets the whole kind of genre of astronomical publications. Um, that would be subsumed or uh, continued for uh, the last 400 years. Uh, and with that, uh, Nick's going to jump in and start talking about um, how the book was made. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, so uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, the, the book was made in a real hurry. Um, Basically, Galileo was doing three things at once, at least. He was uh, making some cosmos changing observations. He was writing about them and he was supervising the printing of that, that written account. And these three activities were overlapping. Simultaneously, as Jason said, he was trying to turn this into uh, academic leverage to get a different job. He had a couple of different offers um, around he was interested in getting out of Padua where he basically reached the ceiling of his earning potential um, and he was kind of playing this game feeling out different patrons um, Mantua um, Florence where he ended up going sniffing around in Bologna as well um, and he'd carry on doing this for the rest of his career even contemplating going over to Holland at, at one point um, so all of these activities are kind of layered over each other and or intertwining simultaneously. He's thinking, even as he's writing up the first book and supervising its printing in Venice, so he's about uh, a marathon away from Padua, um, the, he's thinking of the second edition, the better edition. He's always projecting himself into the, into the future. Um, the first edition is written into, in Latin. He's appealing there to an international audience of the people who matter um, in terms of the discipline where he's inter intervening. But his second edition, he wants to be in beautiful Tuscan um, for a more kind of middling class reader, readership who can enjoy the aesthetics of the, uh, the experience that he's offering up in this frenzy of virtual witnessing. So we have here a letter uh, where he writes to the um, Cosmo de' Medici's personal secretary, uh, apologizing for the book. And you see this repeatedly, this kind of tension in the book. This is a book which, as it announces right in its earliest pages, does great things in a very little space. It's a book of kind of Baroque tensions and paradoxes. And here he says, you know, it, part of this is just a kind of uh, courtier's modesty trope. You know, of course I would have done it better if I'd had time, but I really wanted to get you something special. So here you go, have some planets. Um, but I ran out of time and somebody else was going to find it. There are also some commercial tensions at work here. If we move on to the next slide, please. Um, Jason's done this uh, very nice graphic where he's, he's done the, um, a kind of diary entry, the calendar, retrospective calendar of what happened when. So you can see the, the moon observations uh, starting to write up the rough manuscript drafts, uh, the Jupiter observations. Uh, it takes a couple of days for him to realize that he's really onto something and that he's not just what, looking at some kind of observational anomaly. He's actually witnessing a system that remarkably quickly he makes sense of as this 
philosophically philo philosophical impossibility a um, orbiting system which is not going around the earth that shouldn't happen this is uh, one of his uh, first wedges into the wall of uh, the Aristotelian Ptolemaic cosmos. Um, and then as you move through the month of February, you see that he's also printing um, while still writing. And all of this culminates with um, final Jupiter observations, 2nd of March. Uh, the book is licensed about that point. Um, so it's already being printed before it's been issued with a license, which is a little bit weird. And then printing is finished 12th of March. And the reason for that date, he gives in that letter, he says, you know, I don't want any rivals to usurp me and um, scoop my, uh, my news. But the real issue there, I think, is that the, um, the place to get knowledge out uh, is the Frankfurt Book Fair, which takes place around Easter. And um, to get over the Alps in time, this is really the last possible day that the book can be uh, finished. So the scientific data set is limited by commercial and economic uh, interests there. Um, if we scoot forward to the, the next um, image, what we see here, uh, again, Jason's wonderful uh, graphic design sensibility here, we see a kind of breakdown of the, um, the gatherings of the book. So this A, B, C, D, E, F, G are the uh, sheets of paper, in one case a, a sheet and a half, we'll discuss that in a moment. And you can see that by and large in this book, bibliographical units or printing units, sheets of paper, are also more or less conceptual units. So copy is being written up in lumps and then given to the printer um, at one point uh, so two presses are working on this so um, the uh, so you have simultaneous printing of two parts of the book and copies being uh, supplied if we you'll see that as Jason said a large part of the book nearly 40 percent of the book is uh, the most famous section, but in some ways the, the dullest section, because it is just a kind of data set of this night I saw um, Jupiter and uh, the stars around it looking like this, and then the next night they look like this. And it's basically just kind of laying claim to a series of observations so that the patterns between them can emerge. Uh, these observations have been compared to kind of animated film uh, stills and it's only in the movement between them that you get to see the patterns that prove that these are orbiting uh, satellites as, as Kepler will call them bodyguards is the literal meaning of satellites um, so that's the kind of uh, movement of the book and the proportions uh, of, of each section if we move now to the collation statement this is the uh, arcane language that uh, bibliographers and scholars use to describe books physically. You'll see the author's name, the title, everything's fine there, the uh, place of publication, the, uh, the claimed publisher, not really true, it, this guy wasn't actually allowed to publish, it was actually published by his boss who had just been excommunicated and couldn't put his name on any books at this point, slightly dodgy, illicit publishing going on from Galileo for reasons that are not entirely clear. Um, and then we see the kinds of il illustrations. It's a mixed media piece. There are both woodcuts and etchings. And then this, um, this statement, quarto colon, A through C for D6, E for G. What? So what that means is um, a sheet of paper is has uh, four pages of text printed on each side and then it is folded twice and with that simple origami what you get is a quarto um, gathering you do that again so one of these sheets is called a next one's b next one's c and you'll realize that um, it would make sense just to do that all the way through why is it not a through g4 why is it not just um, uh, a series of seven uh, sheets of paper folded up. We have this D6 there. And what that D6 tells us is that something happens during the printing of the book and during the writing of the book to disrupt the, the most logical and efficient flow, workflow of the print shop. 
and that is Galileo making more discoveries while the book is um, being printed and having to kind of stop the press and jam in more, more material there. It also leads to a little jump in the foliation. There's a, uh, a leaf that has no number on it because the, this was inserted kind of late. The, um, now we come to a, the specific Linda Hall copy um, with the dimensions, a description of the, uh, the binding of it. Um, this isn't just uh, binding fetishism, this is uh, important uh, material. And then we get down to the copy specific stuff, which is what I'll be talking about for the, uh, the rest um, of our time together today. Uh, so moving from the idea of the general edition to what we can learn from individual copies and maybe thinking about some of the states in between that. Um, this text has four authorial corrections and two former ownership statements printed on median quarto size fine paper. We will uh, now tell you what all that means. We move on to the next slide, please. So Paul Needham in his magisterial, uh, I have one almost always next to me, uh, his study, Galileo makes a, a book, um, was the first to note that uh, systematically, I think a couple of dealers might have, have made the, the claim without much evidence, but Needham was the first to note that uh, some copies of this book were uh, printed on a different kind of paper to the normal one. So there's an ordinary paper stock, and then um, which actually varies from sheet to sheet. So that's the one that they, they print each gathering, each sheet first. And then as they get to the end of the print run for each sheet, um, they switch to better, fancier, heavier paper so that it feels, um, feels nicer for the, uh, the person who's receiving it. These copies are probably, there's a document that says there's probably 30 of these copies. They seem to be Galileo's payment. Remember that authors in this period are not getting paid per copy. Uh, they get paid in copies. Um, so Galileo probably got 30 of these copies. There's th this copy belonged to Galileo at one point. And the rest of them are commercial. So the printer's making the money off, off those. Um, the, so this is an example of the Linda Hall copy is one of these 30 uh, fine paper copies. There were 550 uh, copies in total published of which 30 were uh, fine paper copies. So we have a ratio of just under or just over 5% of the, the copies of these uh, kind of non-commercial uh, copies. And that's what we're looking at uh, today. Within the edition as well, if we move to the next slide, there are various um, kind of uh, differences between different uh, copies. So the first one, um, this is the start of the text after the dedication. You'll see Jason's highlighted the, the little text block where it says Medicia Sidera. You see that Sidera is spelled differently with a Y. That's how Galileo used, liked to write it, but it, Gets, uh, it gets changed to uh, a, a more Latinate I. But what we want you to look at there is the Medice. You'll see there's a slight kind of discoloration there. And what that is, is a little uh, cancel slip, a, a printed tiny little slip of paper that some poor um, compositor had to print uh, probably at least a hundred of and stick them in the right place over the copies. Now, about one third of the uh, surviving copies, there are um, less than 100 of these copies uh, of the original 500 survive today. About a third of them either have these um, pasteovers or you can see a little bit of glue where it was there, but it, it fell off. And if you look at the evidence from things like the binding or uh, ownership notes, it seems as though about two thirds of the books, the ones without the bindings, were probably sent off to the Frankfurt Book Fair. Then Galileo realized, um, oh, I've got to, uh, I, I got the name wrong. Underneath this, it says the Cosmica Sidera. He first thought it would be great to call these the cosmic stars in honor of Cosimo. And then he got a note uh, from Florence saying, 
nobody will realize that that refers to Cosimo de' Medici. That's too subtle a gag. Call them the Medician stars. So he had this little slip printed up. He'd, uh, he'd gone too fast before he secured the agreement from his patron and, um, and corrected the, uh, the text. So this we have on um, probably uh, originally at least 100 of the 500 copies, maybe 150 of the copies had this little paste over. We go to the next slide, please. Um, we can see a different kind of correction. So on the same page there, you see down on the bottom right, uh, a handwritten cor correction. This is Galileo's handwriting. It's his nice handwriting. He usually has uses a very messy hand, but he has a special one for special occasions um, where he realizes that he makes an awful miscalculation by a factor of two. And he's actually talking about semi diameters, regular rather than full diameters. So he goes in, in about 15 copies uh, that we know of. So probably all 30 fine paper copies and then a few more that we're going to talk about and hand corrects uh, that. So we have different kinds of intervention in the um, production of the book. We think of books as all the same, all self-identical, but in this case there are actually probably about 10 or 15 different states of, of the book, depending on, um, on how you count them. If we move to the next slide, you'll see um, the level of obsession that Galileo comes in with. Again, a paste over slip. And in some of these, no, uh, so this is, um, you can see the end of the word miraberis. Uh, the E-R-I-S is handwritten, but again, stuck on a piece of paper over the misprint underneath it in Galileo's handwriting. Um, so he's intervening, trying to make some of the copies better than the ones that went out uh, commercially. Um, there's not an absolutely strict hierarchy where you can say this is the best copy that has all of the corrections and this is one that has only a few corrections. They're a kind of mix and match. So it's a little complicated working out the chronology or the social hierarchy of these kinds of uh, copies. Um, let's have a look at the next slide and we'll see one more example of this. And right at the end of the book, he realizes that he got his Latin wrong. He said Medicea uh, with an A and it should have been with an I. So he has to do another little stick over a single letter because you don't want to get your patrons um, so that your grammar's wrong to your patron and uh, sticks that on uh, a few copies as well. So the Linda, Linda Hall uh, Library has some, but not all of these corrections. The one that has all of them is uh, commonly referred to as, um, after Needham identified it really, um, Galileo's desk copy, uh, which would have probably formed the basis for that second edition if it had ever come out. That was later owned by Viviani and that's now in Brown University Library. Coming now to um, think a little bit more um, about uh, this particular copy. So here we, have, here we have one of the fine paper copies. Um, there are 10 of those that we know of that have survived, probably out of the original 30. But then there are another five ordinary paper copies that also have some combination of these handwritten interventions by Galileo. So I think we can kind of talk about four stages of publication or four different issues of this book. There are the books in a kind of rough and ready state, no corrections, that get sent off to Germany. Then there are the ones where it's like, um, oh dear, I got, the, uh, I got my patron, uh, the patronage gaff. Um, let's cover that up, stick, print out the, uh, the sticky bits and, and put those on. Um, probably about another 150 copies. Those are probably for the Italian commercial market. And then there's a, um, the fine paper copies, which go out as far as we can tell to potential patrons and people who matter, um, bishops, the cardinals, those kinds of people. And then there are uh, some other copies which um, seem to go out to, uh, which are ordinary paper, but have lots of corrections on them. Um, 
And those are the most kind of mysterious ones because they seem to be the ones that Galileo paid most attention to, but they're not physically, the materially, the, the fanciest. So the Linda Hall copy is in the third group, the fine paper copies. And what we've managed to do uh, together is work out who Galileo gave it to. So let's take a look now at the next slide and get down into the um, undergrowth of this copy and look at some of the, uh, the inscriptions. We couldn't work out what this said for a little bit, um, but we're pretty sure it says Musei A. Christophori, Med et Kir Mant. Um, so the museum, rather pompous name for his library, maybe he had other <laughs> stuff in there, um, of Andrea Christophori, uh, a doctor and surgeon in um, Mantua. Uh, hey, Nick. Yep. Would, would you muse for a moment about what we discovered about uh, our friend, Dr. Christofori uh, and his circulation habits from a yeah. local library? Yeah, I was just coming on to that. Yeah, oh. yeah. So Christofori, uh, we know a little bit about 1792 to 1877, director big wig in, in Mantua, director of the hospital. Um, he, in 1838, there's a record um, from the most important library in Mantua, the Teresiana, saying, we've had a request from um, Dr. Christofori asking if he can take some of our books home. Now, we haven't got into the archive. We've only read the inventory of this. It might be that he forgot to, or forgot or uh, overlooked the fact that he had an outstanding library book and that this is um, the book, I, I think Finders Keepers at this point. Um, it might have been deaccessioned uh, from, from that library and it may, that record may have nothing to do with this copy. But uh, Christofori was definitely interested in the history of medicine, um, whether he was also reading us, um, we don't know much about his collecting, collecting habits at all. But this book belonged in the mid 19th century to this Mantuan uh, doctor. It's probable that it had spent all of its life uh, up to that point and probably quite a while beyond in Mantua. If we move on to the, um, the next slide, um, you'll see there's a couple of other inscriptions and a, um, a nice uh, sticker. The sticker just says it belongs to the Linda Hall Library. So if anyone steals it, they'll feel guilty and hopefully give it back. Um, and then there are two bits that we can't work out. These are, these are the, mis the nuts that we can't crack. G234, presumably a shelf mark. It might be that that matches up to a library inventory or catalog that we can, we can uh, virtually put it back on the shelf and see what it was sitting alongside, uh, how it was categorized, what the G2 number meant, if anything. And then this, um, this uh, inscription that I can't read, uh, Manelli Monot, Monoth, I don't know, Libraio, it is Monoth Libraia Novara. Thank you, Novara. Yeah, I was thinking Roma, but no, Novara is better. Thank you. All right, problem solved. We're done. <laughs> it's um, job done. <laughs> yep. Excellent. Okay, we'll go hunting in Novara. Probably a 19th century uh, bookseller's inscription there. Um, so we've got that one. Okay, so let's move on. The uh, next slide. Uh, we've got only a few minutes to to go here. So on either side of the wood print there, you can see an ink inscription. Um, we, um, we think it says C.T. S. Bennett Mant V. Um, so the Convento di San Benedetto um, Mantovani. Um, this is the, uh, we identify this as the Convent of San Benedetto in Poleroni, Mantua. Uh, a building that still exists. The library was shut down by Napoleon and shifted into uh, the local uh, Teresiana um, library. More on that in a little bit. Um, so what does that tell us? We have an ownership inscription from a library. Um, the question is, how do we take that evidence of this being a fine paper copy, which means that it was Galileo's, which means that it was sent to someone who mattered with it going into an institution, a religious institution. For a long time, I, I wanted to convince myself that this belonged to Galileo's disciple, Benedetto Castelli, who was the only Benedictine 
that he was really close to. And then um, I realized that Castelli was elsewhere, didn't go, go to Mantua for in this period at all, received his copy of uh, the Sideris Nuncius while he was, I think, in Rome. So that was a no-go. After a little bit of trawling, I found out that another of Galileo's correspondents had moved to Mantua in 1609. Um, and actually, we have evidence now that he read this book. So if we move to the next slide, who is this mystery reader? <laughs> Angelo Grillo, a Benedictine monk. His dates are 1557 to 1629. You've probably never heard of him, but he was one of the most famous poets, a successful poet, strange oxymoron. Um, he wrote about 2000 poems. Uh, he um, also published, uh, he was a friend of Tasso. He wrote mainly madrigals. Uh, and from 1602 onwards, he wrote, he published his letters. Might seem weird to um, spill the beans on all his personal correspondence, but he was interested in offering up kind of examples of how to write really good letters. And he's been kind of um, positioned as, uh, by historians of Italian literature, as one of the first Baroque prose writers. I was interested in Grillo because in one of his letters from 1608, when, Gal when Grillo was actually in Padua with Galileo, um, he uses the phrase um, angelic messenger, um, or sorry, uh, star starry messenger. Um, and I thought that's weird because uh, if we go to the next slide, I came across this uh, scrap of paper in Galileo's um, documents in the National Library in Florence, where at the top you can see a column of Greek words, a column of Latin words, and then a, um, a Latinization of the Greek terms. And what we have, um, these are different alternative uh, titles that Galileo's playing around with. Below that, there are a couple of passages that he's excerpted so that he can use them in the dedication to the Sidereus Nuncius. So we have working notes here. And the bottom one of those three, it says Ang Angelia, and then Nuncius, and then Angela. So that's where he hits upon the title for his book, The Angel, The Messenger, and then uh, Angela. And that title has been suggested to him by this guy, Grillo. If we move to the next slide, only very recently discovered, this was missed by the great editor of Gal Galileana, Antonio Favro, and has only recently made it last year into the um, new appendix of the correspondence of Galileo, is a letter from uh, Grillo to a, um, a Florentine courtier where he talks about his reading. This is undated, but it's published in 1612. So within a year and a half of the publication of this book, probably. Um, and what he says about this book is really quite interesting. I'll translate it for you now. Now with Galileo's glasses, we are already the moon's secretaries and have discovered new aspects of the stars and new stars. And because sense rather than mind is at play here, a new school of lubricous curiosity is open. See how Baroque is. And Copernicus's opinion is raised up that the earth moves like the other globes and that the sun is fixed in the center of the world to illuminate them and that the earth is to the moon what the moon is to the earth and mutually they cast their light upon each other. This is not far from the opinion of Pythagoras who, if I remember rightly, thought that the earth was a star and thus times renew times and opinions and through these circles we gyre and consume the years and human wits. So he ends up with a nice kind of all um, sick transit Gloria Mundi, uh, but the Mundi has been, uh, the Mundus has been transformed radically uh, during that transition. So, and this is the record we have of Grillo's um, reading of this particular copy. Now, interestingly, there's only one copy of the Sidereus, I think it's interesting. There's only one copy of the Sidereus Nuncius that uh, just popped up in the, um, exactly my point, just popped up in the chat. Um, in Oklahoma, uh, there's a dedicatory, there's a, a copy that has a dedication from the author to Gabriello Chiabrera, uh, who is another poet and another admirer of Tasso, 
as Grillo was. Galileo is supposed to hate Tasso and everything to do with them, but he seems to be hanging out with the, um, the Tasso crowd here. There's another copy that's now been stolen, uh, probably by Massimo de Carro, the famous forger and thief, um, from the National Library in Naples, which uh, looks as though it was sent to the Neapolitan poet uh, Giovanni Battista Manso. So the three copies whose um, recipient we can fairly confidently identify are all poets. Mm -hmm. That's a weird way for um, Galileo to go about sending his, his book out. He doesn't send it to scientists initially. He sends his copy to poets and he's thinking about who's going to write the pretty poems in the second edition. He's projecting into the, into the future here. Um, so that's the, the mystery of the Linda Hall copy solved. There's a very brief coda, the last slide. When I first saw that Mantuan inscription, I got really nervous because I thought, I did a little research and I thought uh, the, um, the convent of, um, of Polironi, that library went into the Teresiana library, which still exists in um, Mantua. Should this go back to them? Is this in fact their copy? So I wrote to them um, at this little heart-stopping moment, uh, have Same. you looked at your copy? Um, and they wrote back and said, because there, there wasn't a copy recorded in Paul's Needham census, and they wrote back and said, yeah, we have a copy. And I thought, oh no, don't go and look for it and see the gap on the shelf. And they said, here it is, here's a picture of it. So on the left, you see the Theresiana library copy, another fine paper copy. Nobody knew about, I mean, they knew about it, but uh, no Galileanists have, have ever seen this. This was presumably the copy that Galileo sent to his other uh, potential patrons, the Gonzaga family. And it's been sitting in, the, in Mantua ever since. Now, the other interesting thing about this is that the binding of it is contemporary. Almost all the fine copies are in contemporary bindings. And you'll see that the tooling there, the little gold in um, gold patterning, uh, even though the form is slightly different, that the ornamental flowery things point inwards on one and outwards on the other, the tools are identical. They're the same tools as a copy that's now in Stanford, which had previously been in Genoa. What this tells us, so both of these are fine paper copies, Galileo's own copies, for them to have the same binding means that they must have been bound before they were sent out, I think. And that means that Galileo was probably deciding what he wanted his book to look like for his readers. Um, so we have here, as far as I know, this has um, never been uh, noticed before, um, evidence that Galileo is looking with pretty close attention to uh, the material form of the book. He's not just interested in the text. He wants this, uh, this book to go out to his readers uh, looking a certain way. And, um, and this is how they should look. Okay, uh, 8.44 over around by three minutes. That's okay. Um, let's have some discussion. How do we want to do this? Yeah, thank you, Jason and Nick. That was, uh, that was wonderful information. I, I love that. Uh, you guys are Zoom pros, I think. If you want to, I can read out the questions, or if you want to just uh, look at them, look at them yourselves in the Q and A chat box. Why don't Why don't you read them, Eric, so everybody can hear it, just in case no one. Uh, that'll yeah. That'll work well. Uh, Brian writes excellent summary. Jason, uh, comment. Uh, Brad has a question. Jason, you mentioned the misidentified large crater on the moon. Uh, do you think Galileo's fault uh, was in the design of his telescope that the, he noticed that large crater? No, the emphasis is, is definitely intentional. Um, it's not, I mean, admittedly, his telescope is not what we have today. Uh, you would have a difficult time making the same observations with the same telescope. Uh, but no, he is making a point. Um, he was very conversant in art and design and, and, and is reinforcing his text uh, with the, the illustration that accompanies it. A question from Nina, uh, is this is for you, Nick. Uh, she writes, she, she may have missed this, but how are the fine slash special paper copies identified through the watermark, through the size, something else? So this is uh, all Paul Needham's work. Uh, the, um, 
the watermark, they are different sizes of paper. The fine paper is actually um, smaller, a smaller sheet than the um, ordinary paper, uh, but it's, um, it's thicker and all, all of the evidences of the watermarks is really well, um, well photographed and documented in, in Needham's book. Um, there may be more copies out there uh, that need to be identified as, as fine paper because this category didn't really exist until Needham, um, Needham spotted it. There is also uh, something to be said about, uh, I'm going to show you the geekiest thing I've ever done. I'm not sure if you can see this. So this is, <laughs> is that at all visible there? Yeah, what it we is. Yeah. It's a little scatter graph. I took the dimensions, uh, the width and height of all of the copies that Needham recorded, and I plotted them today. Now, what you can see, the ink ones are the fine paper copies, whereas the um, pencil crosses are the distribution of here, right up here, we have the ones that were never trimmed. There are four copies that were never cut down at all. And then they go all the way down to this one. Um, there's another 10 centimeters each way here. So don't be too alarmed. The book isn't actually this small. It's, <laughs> but it's, it's substantially smaller than the, the uncut book. What you'll notice is that the, um, all the fine paper copies are in a little cluster, which seems to imply that they were never trimmed down. They seem to have had a more sheltered life uh, they're almost all in their original or contemporary 17th century copies, whereas the other ones sometimes quite radically have been repeatedly shaved down. And I saw there was a question there from Daniel Lewis um, saying that their copy has a kind of folding flap. You see that quite frequently where they realize the books uh, have to get into a smaller copy because the edges are getting tatty or they need to be bound alongside something else but you don't want to throw those stars away. So people will cut around them or fold over the pages and cram that huge asterism into a smaller and smaller space. So that's quite a, quite a common phenomenon for the book to get kind of collapsed in on itself as it shrinks over time. So I think I'd, I'd also add that thanks to our work together on this, we've identified that the water, the watermark, which Needham identified as being Venetian is actually a uh, Fabriano mill paper. Um, we found a citation in Bernstein's Memory of Paper uh, that dates a similar paper, uh, an exact copy, uh, not an exact copy, the same watermark um, from 1608. Um, so we're pretty confident that um, the paper is actually not from Venice, but it's from Fabriano, the fine paper. I just posted in chat the link to the Linda Hall Library digitized copy of the first of the edition of Severius. Uh, this is a question for Jason. Jason, I, I, I posted that link to the first edition, but in the library catalog, I see two 1610 editions of Sidereus Nuncius. What's, what's up with that? So one of the things that working with Nick has taught me and that reading this kind of primary and secondary literature is that we as a library typically would describe that as a pirated copy there's a pretty good chance that that's not true because in Galileo's papers in Florence, he describes the method of producing all of the illustrations that would be in the text. Uh, and he describes creating white on black illustrations, which is what the Frankfurt edition is. And so, I mean, yeah, Nick, feel free to jump in. I, it, there's a strong chance that that is, this is problematic, I will recognize it, an authorized edition in Frankfurt. And there are passages in his um, surviving manuscript that are underlined that appear in italics in um, the Frankfurt edition, but don't in the Venice one. So we don't think that the Frankfurt one was just based on the printed Venice one. My impression is that um, probably, uh, and this is a, a little bit um, lacking in evidence, but if I'm right about the importance of the centrality of the Frankfurt book fair to Galileo's intellectual life, that um, it's sold out there. Uh, there's pretty rapid distribution. A local printer then contacts him and says, hey, can we have more of these? And I think he sent possibly, I don't know if his actual cop manuscript went and got, made it back. That would, be, that would be weird, but probably sent a, a manuscript where he had slight changes. It's textually more or less the same. It's an uglier copy. Um, and so we, but it's a rarer copy. So we don't, um, 
but it's not a pirate copy because a Venetian book has no right over anything published in Venice at this point. There's a great, I saw there was a question about the, um, the Frankfurt Book Fair and who would have been there. Um, Ian McLean at Oxford has just come out with a, uh, a really good book centered on the Frankfurt uh, and Leipzig book, book fairs. Um, thinking through these questions of how science and the book trade in, intersect. It's really, really interesting. Um, I saw there were also some questions about Jesu Jesuits. Um, it is true that, so we, we're taught to think wrongly that from this moment on or always, science has been he heading in a collision path with religion and that the Jesuits are going to um, be anti-Galileo. Not at all true. The conflict um, is much more localized and only emerges later on, and it's largely about ways of reading theology, not about how to do science so much. Um, a lot of the copies that uh, Paul Needham identified have early Jesuit uh, college inscriptions on them. And it seems that, and there are even records of Jesuits saying, yeah, of course Galileo is right about uh, Copernicanism um, in the 1630s while the trial is, is going on. Um, so that's a it's, it's important not to think of kind of oppositional blocks here and the Jesuits as the bad guys in this story. And in 1611, they're the first people, the most important group of scientists to confirm Galileo, most of Galileo's observations. Jason, what was the uh, citation of Paul Needham's book? What was the, the title of that again? Uh, Galileo Makes a Book. Galileo Makes a Book. Okay. It's on our, yeah, Nick's holding it up. Uh, we, um, just we, it. it's on the, the event link. Okay. Remember we said it, it's a part of the bibliography of recommended resources. Yes. And I will, uh, I will post that in the, uh, in the chat here in a second. And this is the translation that's, uh, the standard translation with a really good introduction, uh, second edition, Chicago University Press, cheap, assign it to your students as well. If you're teaching this stuff, it's a great read. All right, Megan has a question. Was it typical in Italy during this period to have such a close working relationship between author and printer? Sometimes. Uh, typical, typical. Um, so Gal this is Galileo's third or fourth book, depending on how you count. He hid behind a couple of pseudonyms. He maybe co-authored some stuff. Um, his previous book was with these same printers. And there's a... Um, there's a very nice uh, sonnet um, addressed uh, to him saying, hey, next time you have a great idea, don't forget us, bring it down the shop and we'll print it up, apart from it rhymes in Italian. Um, so he does seem to be, the, Venice is one of the major, um, probably the largest book producing city in Europe at this point. Um, He's in, living in Padua, but spends a lot of time in Venice, knows a lot of uh, Venetian patricians, and also seems to be hanging out in bookstores as well, which is a, a, another important and much understudied uh, center of intellectual life. People go to bookstores to meet authors and have arguments and sometimes even have punch-ups about uh, bookish disagreements. Um, there are ink stains on Galileo's manuscripts as well, not uh, writer's ink, but printer's ink. So I think this is pretty intimate. I mean, the classic place to look is um, a century before Aldus Minucius, where you have these eyewitness accounts of authors composing in the print shop, handing their wet print, or even orally composing, and the compositor trying to set the type quickly enough. So at, at times, um, printers are not just, the, they're not just kind of the manual labor, they're actually the editors and uh, and the compositors are extremely learned, um, uh, almost co-authors sometimes, definitely editors as we would now think of them, intervening in the text, and maybe even saying, you've got to cut some text here because we don't have enough uh, page left for you to, we don't want to waste a new sheet on those two sentences, cut something out here, and um, doing uh, edits on, on the fly. So this does seem to be a pretty intimate thing. I think partly because of the rush job, the rush nature of this, this isn't something that could just be dropped off and then pick up the book in a year. It had to come out like a printed newspaper almost, which is another genre that's just emerging at this point in Venice. Who did the illustrations 
for the book? Uh, like Galileo? Well, Horst Bredekamp, the German art historian who um, um, has done a lot of work on this, uh, seems to think that they, the, they might be done by Galileo. The etchings, so etching is, um, doesn't require much uh, dangerous, dangerous chemicals, all that much skill. You just cover a copper uh, sheet with a uh, copper plate with some wax draw on it basically scratch out what you want and then um pour some acid on and the acid etches etches the lines out so it's something that amateur artists can do you don't need a high level of training galileo was a draftsman he he left some doodles he left some pictures he definitely had this pictures this he's a contemporary of Caravaggio and um, everyone's thinking about light and shade and modeling three-dimensionality and that's what he's doing in that lunar crater right he's making light and dark make three-dimensional shapes um, it's possible that they were by Galileo I, I but there's no actual evidence nobody signs them there's no contracts to send them out to someone else with later the next um, or the there's another book that comes out in 1612 and then in 1613, the Sunspot book, that has a massive attention to the images and the patron who's paying for it, there's this really intense correspondence and huge budget where they're sending it around to different artists. They're having the proofs corrected for the, the images and there they realize that the visual vocabulary, getting it right really matters because they, the scientific data is the images. Nobody can replicate these things. Nobody else has telescopes yet. Nobody else can look at a sunspot that's disappeared. So all you have is the book. The book is the object that the scientists study. So you have to get the images right to convince people that you're right. All right, Jamie has a question. She asked, uh, I was curious about patterns you may have noticed in the corrections. Which of Galileo's amendments appear most often, least often? Do you think this is a question of noticing more issues over time or taking more time with particular recipients' copies? We've got a spreadsheet and it- Yeah, let tough. me grab it. It's on the other side of my office, of course. Um, we're trying to work out that pattern. I think it's a bit of both. I think that there's a gradual realization that there are more uh, copies and we've spotted a um, one copy that uh, one uh, hand correction in a few copies that hadn't been noticed before. We're trying to make sense of it. You can't arrange these just, as, as I said, in, in just a, um, you know, the uncorrected copy and then the final copy, which is Galileo's. There are some that are kind of, um, either because we don't have the information on them or they just have a, a weird kind of, some of them have the paste, some of the pastings, some of them have hand corrections instead of pasting that it's it's not even with a, only 15 copies that have corrections it's impossible just to put them all in a single order there are multiple orders possible is that fair enough yeah and i i think just kind of a, a, a glancing at the spreadsheet that we made um there are two the most common corrections in the corrected copies are, is the semi on uh, recto of B1 and uh, the, the cancel, the manuscript cancel I that we saw earlier. Um, yeah. All right, we're at the top of the hour. So due to the time, let's do one more question. And we've got a, just a good general question from Margo, an aspiring, uh, aspiring history of science student. Uh, she asked, do you have any recommendations for how to study and or the best way to organize information from 16th, 17th century manuscripts? I'm an undergrad who wants to pursue history of science and I'm particularly interested in Margaret Cavendish, but it's a bit intimidating to jump right in. Who wants to uh, take that one? Uh, well, I'll start. Or, because... or if you can each weigh in on that. Yeah. Um, can I make a recommendation and sell our own services at the same time, which are free of charge? Uh, email reference at lindahall.org. Um, that'll be a great first place to start. We'll, uh, one of the great things about the amazing reference staff that I have the pleasure of working with here uh, is that they will help you move from uh, big ideas to smaller ideas. You can, and you can make it more digestible 
Um, I think that would be my first step. Of course, I am a librarian, so of course that's my first step, but start there. Yeah. And I would say um, it's a really interesting question. Scientific manuscripts in, in this earlier period, um, I mean, really what you need is the whole toolkit of the literary editor, the that really kind of robust, uh, you know, um, being able to transcribe, work out um, how to do a full diplomatic transcription. And you need the book skills and you need to be able to read the science, uh, scientific content as well and work out what, what's going on there. Um, so I would build it up as a series of skill sets like that. Uh, read widely in bibliography and manuscript studies. Um, maybe take some courses at Rare Book School. Uh, there are things like uh, Roger Gaskell's um, Illustrating the Scientific Book, if you're interested in the, um, that, that side of things. Um, and then there are, there are some books, this is a, a hot topic, um, Archiving the Scientific Revolution. I think Lorraine Dastin edited a collection on that. Um, there are uh, Archives of the Scientific Revolution by Michael Hunter, a series of case studies. So maybe just um, look, and then this is the really geekish thing to do. When you read your primary sources, read the textual introductions over and over. And I mean, read the, the primary source as well, but think about what it is that you're reading and what's been done in the act of edish, editorship and what's happened between the author's pen, if any trace of that still exists, and the text that you're reading. Think through all those mediations um, and th just think about, uh, these are questions that textual scholars have been thinking uh, about a lot. How do you capture different moments in the, the life of a text? Um, in some ways, I'd, I'd say read, read widely in, um, in literary studies and then bring those skills to bear to the history of science and welcome. And don't be, a, don't be intimidated. I'm, no. it's, it's a years long project, whatever you're researching, I, I'm sure. So it is just. Eric, I've got one final thing to say. I wanna thank sure. you for running this tonight. And I also want to give a shout out to our colleagues in digitization here for making the high res page images of this copy available to anyone. Yeah. And I'd like to thank Linda Hall Library for setting this up and, uh, and Jason for being such a great colleague. This has been awesome. It was a and everyone who tuned in. Yes, great comments. Yes. Great. I wish we could talk for another three hours. Yes, please. Well, we'll, we'll have to we'll have to do this again. Uh, we'll have to do this again soon. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Jason, for such a wonderful presentation. And thank you everyone for attending tonight's program.